So tonight I'd like to offer to share just a few reflections on death and dying. Uh, I suppose in our culture, primarily if people are going to breach the subject of death, talk about it, um, what's, there are a few primary or most popular directions um, through which they approach the subject. And one is, of course, just the fact of impermanence. The fact that we, our lives, like everything else, is impermanent. And that uh, awareness, or the primacy of that awareness, is really spread throughout the culture, I would say. And uh, somewhere or other, I've said before, you know, it seems to me it's the dominant theme in modern poetry, certain modern English poetry. In some way or another, have to do with the poignancy the tr- uh, of of impermanence, the tragedy of a, fu- of a temporal finitude, the ending of things, the fragility of things, the loss, the poignancy and heartache of separation and loss and the need to acknowledge that this is part of life this is what we will meet this is what we will face our own and others death and of course even the cherry blossoms falling from the trees and all that So there is, in the dominance of that theme in a lot of modern poetry, uh, modern English language poetry, there's there's this sort of, there's a lot wrapped up there. There's a sort of gentle encouragement to open to it, but there's also basically a whole metaphysical stance about what's important, about what's real, about what's perhaps the only thing that's really real, about what it means to live life truly, openly, with an open heart, with open eyes. So of course that's huge, you know. Can we open the heart to that? Can we uh, bear that poignancy, loss, separation from those we love? And sometimes, uh, whether it's in poetry or whether it's in the Dharma, you know, this emphasis on impermanence can have, uh, as I sort of alluded to just now, a whole other level, which is really a metaphysical level and a metaphysical stance and assumption of what the Buddha would call nihilism, what the Buddha would call annihilationism, and uh, criticize it very strongly uh, together with its opposite pole of eternalism, criticize them both very strongly, as uh, extreme views to be rejected and avoided. The idea that everything ends in death, that we disappear in death, that there's nothing left. And it's it's a contrasting paired paired view uh, that the soul just goes on forever, lasts forever in time. But often, nowadays, even in the Dharma, there is there is this kind of uh, undergirding of this uh, of the, in in the drawing attention to the imperm- impermanence and the poignancy of loss and separation. It's undergirded again, either explicitly or implicitly, by a whole metaphysic and a whole uh, metaphysical assumption and position that's taken as truth, which is basically what the Buddha called nihilism, annihilationism. That that's the end. There's a complete erasing of our existence. Okay, you can say, yes, well, the atoms that make up our body will be recycled, etc., etc., and, uh, you know, whatever actions and speech we've done will somehow ripple out onwards in time. But basically, there's a... There's a uh, 
a soil underneath there, a whole layer of sediment, better, of nihilism. But anyway, impermanence, one way or another, or in both ways, is uh, is is one of the main uh, or most popular, uh, understandably, sort of directions with which to open up and uh, approach a conversation about death. Another is uh, much more in the wider culture, less in the Dharma culture, of course, is a kind of um, eternalism. So rooted in teachings about heaven and hell and existing forever in heaven and hell, maybe with some intermediate um, uh, or rather sort of provisional uh, stopping over places like purgatory, where you get sort of purified before going to heaven, where you'll stay forever or you'll stay forever in hell until etc. etc. Um and uh, that's a kind of eternalism. Uh, not so popular these days in sort of widespread culture, but still, I think, quite popular is the notion and belief in some kind of afterlife which lasts forever. And what has become fairly widespread, quite widespread, is that in this afterlife, uh, which lasts forever, uh, there is a reunion with one's family. And so, again, just tracing that historically, it uh, can be traced, it, its beginnings can be traced in uh, the 18th and 19th century. So someone called, uh, somewhere on the Lewis, wrote a uh, sort of um, picture of uh, life in Virginia, in, in the USA at the time of Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. And this was one of the things that was beginning to emerge then. So less this idea of heaven and hell, and more emerging this idea of an afterlife that sort of the hell bit was dropped. And so the worst of all possible fates, uh, hell, burning in hell forever, um, that was sort of shorn off things. And what was left was, uh, for many people, this idea that after death we are reunited with our loved ones, uh, with family. And this is still very popular. Of course, there are uh, probably quite a few people who that very idea of being reunited with one's family is uh, forever, is exactly a version of hell. So <laughs> um, it's all dependent, of course. But just tracing ideas is an idea of an afterlife, immortality, uh, somewhere or another. That's part of the sort of, again, quite common... Um, themes or tropes or approaches to the question of death. And then, of course, a third one in Buddhist circles will be reincarnation or more usually rebirth uh, in in Buddhist circles. And and I've said this before, in the Pali canon view, you know, rebirth, the whole teaching of rebirth was mostly terrifying. The idea of just literally endless, forever in time, just being reborn, getting ill, dying again, going through all the misery of people around, people you love dying, um, just repeating that over and over again, maybe in more or less favorable rebirths, and, and some of a lot of the levels of rebirth, pretty miserable. Pretty miserable. Not the level of comfort and ease and medical... Uh, security uh, that we have these days for the most part in the West. So the whole teachings about samsara and endless rebirth was essentially terrifying. If you were really, really lucky, or, or rather if you had played your cards right, which you didn't actually know whether you had done in the past, somewhere in my infinite number of past lives... I may have been a, a really devoted meditator and exceptionally altruistic, and maybe at some point that will earn me a rebirth in, in, in a high heaven for a while until I die from there, and then, and then I'm on the roulette wheel again. So the whole teaching was of samsara and rebirth in that sense was actually terrifying. Nowadays, most Westerners are used to um, as Western Buddhists are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a certain demographic even within Western society. Western Buddhism, 
And most of us are used to relatively comfortable lives, relative security regarding getting ill, and even if we do get ill, is you know pretty good care, pretty good, um, etc. So the whole idea of rebirth is like, oh great, we get another chance, or oh it goes on for more, or I wonder what I'll be next time, or maybe we'll meet again, or or that kind of thing. Um, so it's quite it's got quite a different uh, flavor to it, and sort of uh, the uh, the assumption uh, assumptions behind it give it a certain tenor that's quite different than it probably had in Pali Canon Buddhism. What the Buddha was teaching is get off that wheel, end rebirth. Can you not see just this infinite uh, uh, roulette wheel? And round and round and round, birth and misery and death, birth and loss and death, birth and brief happiness and death and illness and sickness and old age and infirmity and loss and separation. Is it get off the wheel? Really staring at that infinitely, infinite number, uh, was just horrifying. So it's got quite a different uh, tenor and tone. In, in as most it's picked up with quite a different tone and flavor in in sort of modern western notion of it among Buddhists and, and among non buddhists anyway that would be obviously another kind of typical uh, or common way of approaching it certainly within Buddhist teachings approaching the question of death but I don't want to really approach via any of those angles tonight there's also another possible approach which is um for instance, uh, if some of you will be familiar with um, some ideas and recent uh, discoveries and theories in quantum physics, for example. And I talked about this in some other talk fairly recently, but I just can't remember where it was. There's something called quantum entanglement, which some of you know what that is. It's when two subatomic particles, for instance, two photons or... Could be anything. Become entangled, which essentially means that they they're connected to each other. And perhaps, if, uh, for example, if one has a certain kind of quality, for example, what they call spin, doesn't matter what that means. But let's just say spin, an up spin. Then the other one will have a down spin. Uh, and they're entangled in that way. But what entangled really means, or, or the more fuller implication of what it means, is that uh, when something happens to this particle, it also affect, it affects what happens to its, its entangled partner, its partner particle. And it happens instantaneously, even over massive distances. In other words, it's not like this this partner photon signals something to that partner photon. It just seems to happen instantaneously. So this was an idea that came up in... Um, uh, or the, actually, it was Einstein that uncovered it as an implication and just said, this is ridiculous. Uh, how could it be that... Um, two things were wrapped up, up, up in it. Two things were wrapped up. One was that... Um, you could have this instantaneous communication uh, over vast distances. In other words, that information or a signal seemed to be traveling faster than the speed of light, which for Einstein was completely, uh, for his theories, was completely um, axiomatically taboo. It was impossible. And secondly, it wrapped up with this, we don't need to explain why, um, is that it also meant this thing that we've been emphasizing many times over the years, um, that the object, the photon, doesn't exist as having this spin or that spin, this property or that property, um, until we observe it. So there's two implications wrapped up in it, that uh, an object, a subatomic particle, um, its thingness, is, n is it's not a defined thing before we observe it. So again, it's not just that we don't know what it is. It is a defined thing, but we have no way of knowing what that defined thing is. It's actually not a defined thing. It's fuzzy. It's indeterminate. It's indefinite. It's not a thing, as we call a thing. It's not a real thing. And secondly, that uh, there's this possibility of um, instantaneous connection between 
uh, you know, over potentially billions of miles, billions and billions of miles, light, light years and light years. And so this idea came up, Einstein pointed it out, and Neil Spohr said, yes, that's actually right. And we're going to call that quantum entanglement. That does that is a prediction out of the theory. And Einstein said, "Well, that's ridiculous for both of these reasons that he uh, explained and I've just uh, gone into." So there was a debate about it, and then um, Einstein proposed, uh, together with two other guys called Podolsky and Rosen, two other physicists, uh, wrote a paper in the 1930s, I think it was, and uh, suggested that, uh, in a very clever argument, that suggested that this was actually the downfall of quantum physics. It actually proved that things could not be fuzzy before they're observed. They could not be dependent on the observer, on the way of looking. Things are things, independent of, of the way of looking. It was a very smart paper, but there was nothing really anyone could do with it, because they proposed an experiment which would decide it, um, or was it later? It was a physicist called D- David Bell, an Irish physicist called David Bell, later at some point proposed the experiment. I can't remember the exact history, but anyway, David Bell, also very suspicious of this idea of uh, from quantum physics, uh, that fundamentally things don't exist before they are observed. So what a ridiculous notion, and it was really, really um, anathema to both Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and very much to David Bell, who was very, very critical of that kind of idea. There's something, he would say, there's something rotten at the base of quantum physics. And then, uh, uh, I think it was in the 80s, the early 80s, actually it was before that, um, a fellow whose name I cannot remember, so I've written it down here, um, I lost the slip of paper, but um, there have been a series of experiments, basically, going back, I think even starting in the 70s, that actually found a way, based on Bell's, it's called Bell's Theorem, really brilliant piece of uh, thinking, um, proposed the theorem, but there was no way of experimenting it. Someone in California, whose name escapes me right now, picked up on it, here. Uh, no, never mind. And um, and did an experiment which seemed to actually refute uh, Bell's and Einstein's um, intuitions. And so, actually, sorry, things are not definite. There are no things before before uh, observation. Um, later, people pointed out, oh well, there could be there could be a way of explaining those experimental results, uh, you know, in, in another way. So we need to get, uh, we need to take care of those kind of um, possibilities, shut the door on them, make sure make sure we're really getting the result that we think we're getting. And so Alan Aspect uh, did an experiment. Then very recently, um, there was another experiment, again, sorry, I can't remember the names, it doesn't really matter, but um, where they basically did the same experiment and used the light from two different quasars. Quasars are ultra-high energy galaxies billions and billions of light years away. So the light is coming really from near the beginning of, of, the, of the birth of the... Near, you know, near to the birth of the universe, just after the Big Bang. And for some reason, using the light from so long ago, uh, some reason I didn't explain in, in, the, in the explanation, didn't, I didn't understand from their explanation, um, that was supposed to take care of some of the possibilities of some other factors intruding and distorting the results. And what they found was the same thing. So all the experiments uh, looking at this have proved the same thing and proved two, two points. Uh, one is that indeed Objects, things, subatomic particles are not definite things. They are not things before observation. And what they are and how they are, as we've gone into, depends on the the kind of observation, the way of looking. They are fuzzy, indeterminate, indefinite, empty of inherent existence. And secondly, it proves that space is not what it seems. So over over really astronomical different distances, uh, two particles can be instantaneously connected 
and there's no signal traveling, traveling between them. And the implication is, what we think of and how we sense space is just is not real. That space itself is at some level an illusion. It's massive implications. Time also, uh, not what it seems and what we think. And there are lots of other uh, results and experiments and theories in uh, both relativity theory and uh, quantum theory that also uh, have, and even more so these days, um, dis- disrupt, shatter our sense in an independent existence of space and time. That they are real and that the sense, the normal common sense sense we have of space and time um, is is the reality of them. No, they're the common sense sense of space and time, the way we typically think about space and time, what we assume about them is not real, is illusion. Exactly what's going on, it's unclear but it's very clear that they're illusion. In, in the, our usual sense of them is illusion. Space is not what it seems. Distance is not what it seems. Things can be intimately, instantaneously connected, entangled with each other over vast distances. Doing something here makes a difference over there. Doing something over there makes a difference over here because there's, the space is not what it seems. So... One could uh, pick up those kinds of ideas uh, and say, okay, well, what does that imply about notions of death and separation? But I actually don't know uh, exactly what that implies uh, with regard to death and our experience uh, around death and dying. So I'm going to leave that. So those are kind of four most uh, normal normal areas, uh, normal uh, ways of approaching. And actually, I want to see if we can approach uh, with a more phenomenological approach via our experiences and appear uh, via, via our experiences um, and what appears to us. The phenomenological approach and an inquiry into that, and experimenting with that. I mean, we could could pick up this quantum piece because it is the case that uh, you know beliefs, inherited beliefs, inherited ontologies, and again we're talking about ontology here. What is the ontology of space? Does it inherently exist? What is the ontology of a, a subatomic particle, allegedly the most basic building block of matter? What's the ontology there? So, but it is the case that inherited beliefs and condition, shape, and limit our experience. What appears to us, and remember the word phenomena means appearance. So, might it be that if we start, you know, taking ideas from physics or whatever and using them to question our inherited beliefs, that that might open up our experience with death? Yes, it might. I'm just not quite sure what to take exactly from that other than the most sort of vague, vague notions of interconnectedness and whatever. Um, as I said, what I'd rather do tonight, uh, what I'm going to do tonight, is is take more of a phenomenological approach, starting with our uh, experience and approach it that way, inquiring, and especially the phenomenological approach um, as it pertains to, as it emerges from soul making dharma, dharma and sensing the soul practices and openings. So, what is our experience when we? Um, uh, approach death, our death, someone else's death, the whole question of death and dying, um, through uh, this, with the support of soul making dharma, but with 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 the support and through the modalities of sensing with soul and the kind of openings that sensing with soul brings. So, in that phenomenological approach, of course, um, that phenomenological phenomenological approach as much as the phenomenological approach that has to do with just ways of looking at emptiness, both of them recognize that ideas, logoi, conceptual frameworks are always involved in our experience. 
and that they condition experience. So there's always idea, conception, logos, conceptual framework involved in any experience. And it has a conditioning, shaping, fabricating and limiting um, influence effect on our experience. So uh, 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 um, uh, an intelligent and more powerful phenomenological approach has to acknowledge that, has to recognize that. And of course it, it works the other way too. Our experience, um, if it's repeated enough and powerful enough, starts to change our ideas, our logoi, our conceptions, conceptual framework, and that's all part of the whole era psyche logos dynamic, that notion. So, phenomenal, phenomenological approach, as much as it comes out of and is born by the uh, sensing the soul uh, approaches and openings, recognizing uh, that ideas and logoi are in our experience and inevitably, and that they condition experience, recognizing also that there's flex, there's the possibility of our flexibility with our ways of looking and with the ideas that are in the chitta and in the way of looking at any moment. And the interest in uh, that flexibility of ways of looking and the conception that's in there at any time and what that does, what that does to experience. So this is really the, the, the kind of tack that I want to take tonight. And in terms of ideas, of course, uh, we must acknowledge that we have, or we uh, we are the bearers of a mixed inheritance. As much as we are the bearers of a mixed inheritance with regard to ethics, as we were talking, values and all that, with regard to ontology, with regard to epistemology, we inherit from the culture um, ideas and perspectives, and the actual sense of things. And so, with regard to death too, inevitably, uh, we, we also uh, receive a mixed inheritance, a kind of hodgepodge of ideas. Um, so, I don't know if I'm making too much of this, but uh, it's just that it it came up the other day, and it was something I noticed when I was first diagnosed with cancer. And going to the hospital and going to the oncology ward for the first time uh, it was really in the oncology ward, so it was it was after my operation, in fact, so a few months after I was diagnosed with cancer. And they there was some talk, or there was a sign, or something, or piece of paper, and it was talking about different. Uh, sort of departments within the oncology department, and and one one phrase really struck me was the end of life pathway. The patient is on on the end of life pathway, and even now at the um, hospice, the hospice nurse talk about end of life, like it's a phrase now, and how little I heard the word dying or death. In fact, I'm not even sure if I ever have heard a, a, a doctor utter or nurse utter those words, actually, come to think of it. Passing on. Are those, I'm not sure if I'm sensing something here. It's not a big deal that I'm, I'm mentioning it. Um, or rather, it's not a big deal. It potentially is a very big deal. I think I'm not really sure whether I'm uh, sensing something underneath that that's you know, it's actually an expression of something. Are, are people, is the medical institution avoiding those terms? I'm, I'm not sure. And if it is, what's going on? Is it because uh, avoiding words like death and dying and, and the sort of old, old fashioned now passing on or passing away? Is it that life is all there is? So we talk, they talk about end of life. And end of life pathways seemed a little even more kind of bizarre almost to me, sort of jarring, as if the choice of terminology, I wasn't sure whether it had really come from the hospital administrator's 
um, sort of flowchart of how they need how they need to sort of uh, you know manage all these patients. So they have a flowchart of where where the different patient goes into chemotherapy, into radiotherapy, or after that doesn't work, then they're on this, and then they're on, and then they're on the end of life pathway. And whether that's just a term reflecting more their management um, solutions than actually a sort of existential position. I don't know. Uh, but there seem to be the, the, the sort of avoidance of the terms death and dying. Is that because life is deemed as all there is, and death is not seen as in itself a something, an event, a momentous doorway, even if it uh, might be a doorway to total non-existence, it's still a doorway. If you just avoid that sense uh, or that whole notion of it by using different words, end of life. I don't know. So maybe, maybe irrelevant. Um, but as I said, yeah, we've we've picked up. I think undeniably we have a, a mixed inheritance, as we do for so many things in our culture, and probably all, maybe many. Um, going back to India at the time of the Buddha, people the, the Buddha had a mixed inheritance, um, and, and Tibetans have a mixed inheritance, and Tibetan Buddhists, and all that. So that's just part of living in a, uh, you know, not a sort of totally original Paleolithic culture or something, I imagine. Anyway, I don't even know. Um, and we inherit then a mixed bag of beliefs uh, with respect to death. So it's religious beliefs and traditions, even if we're not religious or whatever, that, that comes to us from that stream. Um, but also secular or non-religious beliefs. And yes, I use that word uh, very deliberately, secular beliefs, non-religious beliefs. Because usually they're not positions about death that are actually um, thought through with any great intensity or originality. They're something we inherited from the sort of uh, evolving and emerging secularism of our culture uh, over hundreds of years. And they're beliefs, they're not really, uh, they're not knowledges, they're not uh, logical deductions that one has carried out on one's own. Um, they're not certainties. They're not, as I said, not even rigorously uh, with a lot of uh, question or with a lot of intensity or vitality or originality. So we have, all of us, prob- all of us probably have, most of us probably have, better to say, um, this mixed bag of beliefs, some religious in origin, some secular in origin around death. And that's quite, I mean, it's, I think it's, again, important to acknowledge, important to realize what's going on with me, what goes on, what uh, steers and shapes and colors and as I said, limits my sense of things, in this case, of death and dying. And it's also, it, 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 again, since, since being ill, so I've run into or I'm witness to all kinds of expressions um, that reveal different attitudes and beliefs around death. And sometimes this very mixed bag is apparent um, in in a single utterance that someone might uh, make. So I'm thinking of two people now, both of them uh, uh, staunchly, even aggressively secular, and both of them said uh, a similar thing. Both had uh, were given pretty serious cancer diagnoses, um, and but not necessarily, um, f- you know, fatal. Um, and both of these pretty staunchly and aggressively secular uh, men said one was in his fifties, I think, when he was diagnosed, and the other was in his seventies. Person in hospital, and both of them said, "I feel cheated." When they got the diagnosis, I feel cheated. Both staunchly secular, and you think, "Well, 
how does that work? How can you feel cheated if you have this kind of aggressive secular position? Who is it you feel cheated by? What is it you feel cheated by? Where do you have a sense of an expectation to 80 years of life? What's going on in, again, in, in the mixed bag of beliefs and inheritances there that you could feel cheated at the same time as espousing a kind of secular view, atheistic view very strongly. So that's interesting in itself, but uh, uh, this kind of um, yeah, strange bedfellows that go, 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 uh, that go to make up our view, our beliefs, our sense of things, our responses to things, as basic as death. Well, there's a second piece here. I feel cheated also uh, indicates something about one's relationship with existence, or one's view of existence. How different. I feel cheated. I'm owed something. I expect something about the duration of my life. How different that is from uh, a sense a view, a uh, an idea, but also a sense, a soul sense of life and death as gift and illness. Life, illness and death as gift from the divine and somehow to the divine. How different that is and I feel cheated. I'm owed something and I didn't get it. I was expecting something. I expect something and I'm not being given it. Versus life and illness and death as gift from the divine and to the divine. Now I mean this as a sense. Again, all this, all that I'm talking about and most of what I've been talking about in this series of talks and all the soul-making Dharma talks is really based on experience. You can hear that. And for someone who's outside of that sensibility, who hasn't really had experiences that open up uh, the sense of things, the sense of self, the sense of other, the sense of the cosmos, the sense of death and all that, the sense of illness, um, through imaginal practice, through sensing the soul, it can, it's it just so alien and disturbing and alarmingly, um, well, just alarming. The sense of what, your death and your illness are a gift from God. How does that work? Your early death and your difficult illness and your painful illness and all that limitation are a gift. What are you, what are you talking about? And, and, and uh, it's an affront and a nonsensical notion. But for someone who's practiced, um, that kind of thing, and that kind of blossoming of the sensibility and the very sense of things, including one's illness, including one's early death, can be there. It's a gift from God, from the divinity, from the Dharmakaya, and gift to the Dharmakaya. And gift meaning mystical gift a mystical gift from and to the divinity to the dharmakaya but even that word mystical is so problematic for some people and for some people it just means nonsense I've talked about this elsewhere something that doesn't make sense um, or to do with mystery but we're not talking about mystery in the sense here of um, the, the, the sort of mystery of why there is existence at all, why there is a universe, why is there are there human beings. Uh, because behind that sense of that kind of mystery is a sort of baffled, baffledness, like it's just completely arbitrary. That kind of mystery and that kind of question, why is there anything at all? Why does anything exist? What a mystery. Actually, it's already assuming a kind of purposelessness in the question. It's not really a question, it's just already assuming a kind of purposelessness and calling it mystery. Just the sort of arbitrary, 
arb seemingly arbitrary arbitrariness of the fact of any existence of anything. But here, mystical and mystery as meaning having dimensions, having unfathomability, inexhaustibility, beauty, all of that. And how different I feel cheated. I expect this many years, or whatever it is, versus the whole uh, movement of life and death gift, the gift of life and the gift of death, receiving that gift and somehow giving it as well, giving my life, giving my death, and that being a very different kind of gift, a mystical gift. What I really want to go into tonight is kind of a little bit, just 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 a few a few possibilities and the many possibilities of what what can make death okay. What can make death okay? And um, even that sounds like a bit of a stupid question because what do I mean by okay? Um, excuse me. I don't just mean a kind of Shrugging, oh well, that's, you know, death, that's just life, right? Life goes with death, it's just life. So, that's it, we all have to, you know, that's the deal. I certainly don't mean, or I mean much more than that. I mean also much more, and this should be already clear, than just bearing uh, the kind of tragedy of loss. It's just okay, because I can bear our tragic existential situation. I can bear the poignancy of it. I can bear the fragility of life. I can bear even my personal losses and the grief that comes with that in my heart. So, yes, that's a part of it. Can I bear it? Um, uh, can I hold that? But I really, what can open the whole question up more, the whole issue, the whole, um, the whole panorama, the whole horizon of death up more, without reverting to uh, beliefs in rebirth or eternal afterlife, whatever. So, this is what I want to just offer a few things, share a few things that may uh, be ways of, uh, among among many possibilities, may be ways of opening things up, opening the sense of things up. Now, of course, death is difficult when it's our death we're contemplating. Very usually that's a difficult thing, of course. Um, sometimes not, and for different reasons, but um, that may have nothing to do with deep insight but, um, and deep opening. But death is difficult when it's ours, generally speaking. And, of course, it's also difficult when it's someone else's, when we love someone. And there's the looming... Their death is looming, their death is coming as the imminence of our loss. So it's difficult in, in uh, both those uh, directions, of course, and I want to say a little bit about both. So, what makes death okay? Um, clearly, well, it should be clear to most people that um, accumulating a lot of money is not going to make death okay. Um, accumulating a lot of pleasant experiences or having more pleasant than unpleasant experiences is also not going to make death okay. Sometimes, uh, what's more common is um, people kind of, and again, it might be um, not so conscious or not so... Uh, you know, articulated, or it might be, um, that accumulating experiences makes death more okay. So we have this uh, idea of, what is it called, bucket, bucket, bucket something, you know, the things I want to do before I die, the experiences I want to accumulate. Or even a sense of someone perhaps being told they have a terminal diagnosis or something like that, and it's like, oh, well, I've had a lot of, you know, I've done a lot of really good things, I've done a lot of really interesting things, I've travelled here, I've, you know, whatever it is. I've accumulated experiences. 
So for some people, that's a kind of something that they look to to make death uh, more okay. And it might be, to some extent, that that works a little bit for some people. It might also be, and what I've noticed is, is again, this sort of like, oh, well, um, I've had a long life, or they've had a long life, or at least it's as, as long as or longer than the average length of life. And if it's less than the average, then potentially we can feel cheated. But if it's longer than the average, then, oh, okay, there's some, there's some okayness there. And again, that may help a little bit with, with uh, some perspectives. But you can see how in modern culture we have very little, um, very little wiggle room to really open up the sense of death and how we, how we might feel about it, think about it, and die. And, of course, um, uh, you know, practicing, uh, 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 noticing impermanence, reflecting on impermanence, letting the fact of the impermanence of all things impress upon you. You know, a lifetime of doing that will also help with regard to death. You know, very... Uh, often stressed in some dharma, dharma kinds of dharma, insight dharma as well very the central uh, the central sort of reflection that's, uh, that's stressed and that's practiced and of course that may help it may well help it should help but it may also be quite limited how just repeated reflection on impermanence, repeated, uh, um, the repeated impression of the fact of the impermanence of all things. It may also be relatively limited what that can do um, in terms of how we actually end up feeling about our death or the death of a loved one. So definitely helpful, but may also be may also be limited. And then sometimes you get, of course, well, uh, the other view, and it's again it's typical in some some streams of Dharma, um, there's no self really, there's no self that dies, there's just a process of the aggregates. There's just a process of the aggregates. And so, because there's no self, there's nothing really to fear in death. Because what the self really is, is just this process of aggregates in time, of the physical and mental aggregates. Um, so, I've said before, uh, to have that as the only view of self and existence is, well, I don't know what the word for it is, just narrow, certainly, um, but kind of silly, really. It's not adequate for our psychology, it's not adequate for life, it's not adequate for death. It's not adequate for relationship, which I'll come back to. It's not phenomenologically adequate. As a temporary mode of relative kind of pr- pr- perspective that can be used as a provisional truth and a provisional way of looking, it can be helpful at times on its way to something deeper, for sure but as a kind of primary way of orienting to the, the dukkha and the pain of death. Mm. Yeah, not so sure. If you ask me, and I have actually shared this elsewhere, uh, written a little bit about it, um, what is it for me that makes as I'm approaching death, what is it that makes my death uh, okay, much more okay? Like a a whole different level of okay, so the word okay doesn't really even do it. What is it that opens out the whole sense of death and brings a level of beauty and peace there? I've shared this with said before, but I think I can divide them into perhaps four and one is is emptiness practice and understanding 
and by which I, I do not mean limited at that view of the self is just the process of aggregates and time. I mean something way beyond that. I mean a practice and understanding that opens to the unfabricated, the complete transcendent beyond the deathless. No subject, no object, no time, no world. No this, no that. Beyond all perception. And that sense of that realm or dimension, as the Buddha sometimes called it, that does something. The timelessness of that, it does something. And sometimes it's shared that there's a sense of that being just there as a holy other, transcendent other, and sometimes as shining through existence, through this existence, this world of temporality, and thingness, and subjects, and objects, and selves. But it does something, either way, both ways. And uh, similarly, seeing the emptiness of time, the emptiness of past, future, and of present, complete emptiness of time, the emptiness of any present moment. There's something about that. It would have to be, of course. Death is uh, impermanence. It's connected intimately, obviously, with the, with notions of time, senses of time. You see the emptiness of time, and that does something that opens up the sense of death. And of course, um, as I've talked about recently and before, even going beyond the unfabricated, where we're uh, open to appearances that are felt and sensed and known as empty, magical and divine. I talked about this earlier in the series somewhere or other. Empty, magical, and divine appearances. And in that, with that, shot through all that, in the magic, the emptiness and the divinity is, is a sacredness. And that sacredness, that sense of sacredness that comes right out of emptiness practice, the sacredness that comes out of emptiness practice, the sense of sacredness that comes out of emptiness practice, that makes a huge difference. There's so much power in that in relation to death. As the Buddha said in, with a few different examples, you know, one moment of knowing that is worth a hundred years of, and he gives a lot of examples, pain-free life, a hundred years of knowing. I think he says even knowing impermanence or one moment of knowing that if the whole di- the whole sense of existence is, is 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 something happens it's turned inside out it, that's not even the right word but in that the whole relationship with death is different is opened out is uh, pacified and made beautiful so for me that's one that's one uh, real way or direction or approach uh, which really um, changes the relationship with death, makes it profoundly okay. And a second is related to what I said earlier about this sense of gift. And at all different levels, receiving gifts, or having received gifts, gifts showered on uh, oneself, and also given gifts. So at every level, you know, I can see in my life I've been given a lot of gifts. I never felt growing up, despite all the, you know, craziness and difficulty and uh, dysfunction, to use a out-of-date word in our family and upbringing and all the intensity, intense sort of craziness there, I never felt that I would 
go hungry or go without a roof over my head. So I ran away. Um, so just that level of gift, and the gift of education, and the gift of so many gifts. So at that level, but also the gift of life itself, and the gift of uh, what's given particularly to me, and particularly to you. Your particular gifts, and wrapped up in my, my particular gifts, and your particular gifts, and your particular dukkha. They go together, often. Well, certainly any gift I'm given brings, um, or any deep gift I'm given seems to bring with it its kind of concomitant accompanying dukkha. It's wrapped up in it. And I can see that I've been given certain gifts in this life and certain abilities and capacities and whatever you want to say. So that's all, all these senses of gift and the sense of giving, of having given, that that has been important. It's been so important to me to give. Again, at lots of different levels, just to practice generosity but to give of my gifts and to give to the world and to give to the future and to give of the beauty I sense, the beauties I sense, to pass that on, to communicate, to let something come through, to share that. So all these different levels and what I talked about when I think it was in the talk on pain and that kind of thing, this sense of gift received and given that sense of existence, and even, as I said, even the illness and the pain and, and the dukkha and, and the early death as being part of what I was, uh, received, part of what, what was gift to me, and part of somehow that I am uh, sacredly giving back, or in, in a sacramental way giving back. That whole sense of life uh, also does something to our sense of death. I think, very much, or I feel, very much. And then a third way is the sense of having done, having tried to do one's duty, having uh, tried in one's life, even if one hasn't really understood it or had the words or, the con or a conceptual framework that will hold it and carry it, not being able to articulate it, only dimly sensed, or maybe not even sensed at all, that one has tried to do one's duty. One has uh, let oneself and, and worked so that the uh, one's life refracts the daemon, reflects the angels out ahead that call to one, that govern one's life. So this sense too, and one can never succeed in that 100%. I've said that the reflection is never completely perfect, virtually. It's always falling short. But one has tried and uh, let that lead one's life devoted oneself to that, put that as primary, even as I said, if one doesn't think in these terms at all, that one can hear something like that and understand, yes, I can see that I've done that. I've tried to do that. And fourthly, um, and connected with the whole thing we were talking about with the ethics talks in this series, that one has lived in a way uh, that's tried to be, one has aspired to living uh, a really worthwhile life, a life that is worth living, a beautiful life. One has aspired towards the good, with a capital G, towards what really matters, a sense of what really matters. Taken the trouble to 
to find out what that is for oneself and to get one's bearings even in times of confusion and being inundated with other pushes and pulls and indoctrinations and advertisements and peer pressure and all kinds of things. Risks and threats. And that one has lived in that direction. One has tried to live as much as possible in that direction. So those four things, for me, emptiness in that much fuller sense, the sense of gift, received and given at all those different levels and all those different ways, the trying to discern and to do one's duty, duties, refracting the daemon, and the attempt to live uh, what really constitutes a worthwhile life and sense of that, a beautiful life, a really good life with a capital G. So for me, those are some uh, of the principal things that really make a difference. And of course, um, all of those are actually connected, those four uh, kind of directions or approaches. Especially, they're connected through, of course, soul-making practice and the sensing of soul sensibility. The sense of refracting one's dame and doing one's duty. The sense of life as gift. Gifts received and given at all these different levels. The sense of living in the direction of uh, uh, what sense is a really beautiful life. And the emptiness of it all. The very... Not neither real nor not real nature of all of that. All of that comes together and is intimately woven together in, in soul making practice and sensing of soul sensibilities. Actually, just to add something to that list, uh, because most of what's in that list of four things for supports or openings that transform the relationship with death. Uh, most of what's in there are kind of currents and efforts and movements and openings uh, over uh, over a lifetime or over you know years, really directions. So just to add to that, Something which I've already shared in another talk, uh, I think it was in the talk on diet practice, soul making diet practice, I think it was there, it doesn't really matter, but um, there is the possibility of being so touched by a soul making experience, having an opening in imaginal practice or sensing the soul, where one's profoundly moved by a, a sense of grace, a sense of eternality, a sense of participating in something so unfathomably beautiful and divine. And remember when we use that word participation in this context, in the context of soul-making, we use it as one of the elements of the imaginal, we're really meaning something much more, much more profound than what its usual meaning points to, like participate in this or that. Something almost impossible to articulate. Mystery, profundity and sacredness in the sense of that participation. That just having those few minutes of experience transforms the relationship with existence and with death. So it could be in diet practice or in a group soul-making practice or it could just be solo with so-called intrapsychic image or it could be sensing the soul, some experience um, perhaps in nature where there's a sensing the soul 
in the soul making imaginal perception. And one feels as if so much grace bestowed on the being, the wonder, the privilege, the profound sacred privilege of opening to something so divine, to the divine in that way. We're just being touched by that, having that grace come, participating that way, having that sense of privilege. It changes the sense of death. Because of the grace, because of the privilege of participation, because of the opening to eternality, to timelessness. And that kind of experience is very different than uh, what I was talking about earlier, the start of trying to accumulate experiences. Because the attitude and the impulse to accumulate experience tends to be restricted to one dimension, tends to be flat. And, and therefore it needs more and more experiences. It always needs more experiences. Because the eros there is is limited to one dimensionality. Because it's not for some reason, either because of the limited logos or for some other reason, not allowed to open up more dimensions, to open two more dimensions. It cannot penetrate and open two dimensionality. So the pothos in the eros, that which wants more in the eros, cannot go, so to speak, deeper into other dimensions other aspects, facets of what it, what it wants and what it loves. It has to go, so to speak, horizontally on the same level for more and more experiences. I have to, now I've been there in my travels, I have to go there. Now I've been there, I have to go somewhere else. More, more travel, been here, been there, flown here, flown there, seen this, seen that, so to speak. So we've explained this in Ecology of Love, I think, Path of the Imaginal, plenty of other places. When the Eros is allowed to open up the dimensionality, open up the Logos, open up the Psyche, and when there's that really profound experience of an opening to some soul-making experience of the imaginal sensing the soul, then it has, in contrast to this kind of accumulation of experience, it has such a humility in it. There's a real humility in it, partly because of the sense of grace, of inexplicable gift. And with it, there's also a sense of, this is enough. This is enough. This gift is enough. That glimpse, those couple of minutes, that's, that opening to something, that, that sense of deep participation, that sense of the privilege of that opening and that bestowal of grace, is enough. That gift was enough, those two minutes. And that, that makes a difference in relation to death. It's humility and a sense that this is enough that comes with the grace. And there is a sense, you know, because our experience fades, of course. Experiences are impermanent. Experience fades, but somewhere in our being, even when that sense of things and that experience feels inaccessible, it's not apparent There's, the, we can still be loved, I know something because I've, I've tasted it I've experienced it, I know something even when it's not at some later time apparent or accessible and this knowing in the being I know something about existence I know something about human being I know something about life and that's something that I know, even if I can't quite articulate it, I can't really encapsulate it in words, it does something in relation to, it does something to my relationship with death. It's enough. It's enough. And it makes death much more okay. So there's also that that I would say is really important. 
There, there is certainly the importance of the currents in one's life, these longer trends and longer uh, strivings and longer devotions, the, the sense of the whole life with all its uh, beauties and all its difficulties and challenges and travails and tragedies, all of that as gift received and all the gifts given on so many levels of one's life. This is a, a longer term devotional trend in the sense of trying to do one's duty, trying to discern, do one's duty, trying to seek out and sense what is the life that's beautiful, that's worthwhile, that's really good. And even the journey into the experience of emptiness, all this is a long, longer term devotions and trends. But I just want to add to that, there's also the possibility, I think a very important possibility, of just these openings, sometimes of soul-making practice, that are so profound and so imbued with grace and beauty, and a sense of the privilege of participation, whatever we want to call it, in the divinity of things at such a deep level, that, that those moments, not so much longer term trends, but they're uh, moments, or, you know, minutes or whatever, sometimes hours, but sometimes they're just really a few minutes, and that those experiences potentially can make a huge difference in our relationship with death. It's enough. It's enough. I've had that, and just those two minutes are worth more than a long life or a hundred years of health or whatever it is. So that's just a little bit. I want to come back later on and share someone else's experience or approach to their own death. There's so much to say, we can only say a little bit, but... Of course, like I said, sometimes it's it's another person's death, someone uh, whose death is very difficult for us. And um, you know, sometimes we encounter people who what language could we use here? We feel they've lived their image. They've uh, refracted their daemon. To use that language, we feel that. They've lived their image, they've reflect, refracted uh, their day when they lived in a way that echoes and mir- mirrors and does the duty uh, of their daemon, of their image, of their, again, if we use this language, their individual idea, uh, in, the, in the idea with a capital I, in the ideal realm, individual form, their ideal person, was different language. And when we have that feeling about someone, we are touched deeply by them and their life and touched by that whole what we feel we are sensing there and witnessing because we sense the divine and the deep soul is coming through that person I'm thinking of someone like John Coltrane for me early death but somehow just did what he was here to do so devotedly, so beautifully, really living his image, doing his uh, the duty of his daemon. And it makes, uh, it touches profoundly. And we have the sense something is going on here um, that has to do with, you know, your language, divinity, whatever, God, deep soul, and the soul loves that. The soul loves seeing that, witnessing that, sensing that. And of course, when when we have that sense about someone else, um, when they die, you know, naturally the grief uh, then is deep. For the very same reason, the soul loves that. There's so much beauty there. So much being touched by the divine, so much sense of divinity coming through, when they die, the grief will be deep for, for, for just that reason. But in a way, you know, we have them still too. We have them uh, still after death because in a way they are 
eternal. Their image has impressed itself on us. And so they can be an image for us. With all their um, elements of the imaginal, including you know, the eternality and the timelessness. But they're already image. And that image lives on with eternality, with timelessness. So we have them. Yes, there's a loss. Of course there's a loss. And of course there's the grief. But somehow, we still have them. In uh, Bach's St. St. Matthew's Passion, there's a really gorgeous aria. Um, I think it's it's um, sung by, by the I don't know, baritone or bass or something, but the character is, I think, Joseph of Arimathea. Some of you will know from the Gospel stories. He, um, he agreed to bury Jesus or he volunteered to bury Jesus um, after the crucifixion. And the lyrics of this aria, it's in German, it's in, Mache dich mein, meine Herze rein, ich will Jesum selbst betra- begraben. Um, which in sort of slightly archaic English translates as, Make thee clean my heart, I will bury Jesus. And that's the only lyric of the whole aria. Make thee clean, my heart. Make yourself pure, my heart. I will bury Jesus. And, again, I know people have different histories with all this, but for me there's just so much love and soul, um, certainly in the music, but also in, in that very sentiment, make thee clean, my heart. I will bury Jesus. What does it mean to bury, in this case, to bury Jesus? Bury someone uh, we love, bury someone f- whom we feel uh, they lived their image, the divine came through them. What does that mean? Bury, to bury Jesus, to bury this person in my heart, in my soul. And this is a real possibility for us that, they, that we can do that. Bury this person in the heart, in the soul, really, that they somehow live in me, live for me as image, as icon. So, yes, all the grief, I'm, I really don't want to sort of say all oh, this erases the grief, it'll just be no problem. But there's a whole other possibility that can open up. And even if we take that, that lyric there, make thee clean my heart, I will bury Jesus. What does make thee clean mean? Soul making dharma, make make yourself clean means means the purity. Purify. And what does that mean? It means in soul making dharma terms, it means fullness of intention. That's a purification of our intention. It means all the sensitivity of the poise of sensing the soul and even the um, preparation for sensing the soul it means the element of the imaginal the humility, the reverence the grace the, the participation, the autonomy also of self and other, the beauty, the eros this is all part of make me clean all the elements but particularly fullness of intention particularly uh, humility particularly sensitivity, particularly the imaginal middle way, there's also a purification. As you know, when that when that starts to either reify or uh, you know go the other end where images are dismissed, then it's not uh, we don't have the container for the real uh, the power of the imaginal sort of uh, rippling out and opening up more and more horizons. Something will get limited, stuck, rigid, like the view of reality is stuck in a, either realism or, or kind of uh, dismissive nihilism. So we do love deeply when we 
see or sense, or when our sense of someone is that they have lived their image, refracted their diamond. It touches us deeply. And then because of that, yes, there's a deep grief. And we don't really, uh, we want that grief. We don't, we don't want to get rid of it. But at the same time as the grief, alongside it, for the very same reason that there's such deep grief, there is, there is the gift of their impression on us, which, they, which has already been made. They've already impressed themselves as image. They've impressed on us. And in that sense, we can bury them, so to speak, keep them. A place for them as image, as icon in our soul, in our heart. Make me clean my heart, I will bury Jesus. I don't know if you can, can you hear all the, all the, all the soul and all the love in there. Again, with, with the help of Soul Making Dharma, we can take this and interpret it in different ways that really open it up and open up our sense of life, our sense of death, our sense of, <coughs> um, in this case, the death of another. And it's also the case with all this that, uh, you know, yes, as I said, there will be the grief there, but something is, I don't know what the word is, redeemed, is that not quite the right word? But in other words, it's not just loss. There's gift here, even in the death. The death is gift. The death um, is, is loss and therefore Grievable, of course, and grieved, of course. But even what seems uh, like tragic, so Jesus' death, very early death, or John Coltrane's death, very early death, what seems tragic can uh, then have, uh, uh, as well as the grief, as well as the tragedy, have this whole other level that it opens up, which is gift and beauty and an opening that sometimes may not have been there even without the death so much. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, one of the early theologians, Christian theologians, um, for him, uh, providence, the way, the way the divine or translate into Buddhist language, the way the Dharmakaya kind of takes care of us with, with providence. That's what that words mean. Providence does not prevent evil, prevent bad from happening. It does not prevent early deaths of those we love, etc., or ourselves, but seeks to overrule it for an ultimately good end. Providence does not prevent the bad from happening, but seeks to overrule it for an ultimately good end. Now we could hear that as a kind of just a doctrine, as something we're asked to believe, and as a certain view. But again, we, I think with soul making dharma practice, practice, actual practice, we can open up uh, a, 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 an actual sense. This is our actual sense. We go through. We don't push away the grief or close the heart. Refuse to feel that doesn't just become oh it's fine everything's fine oh well impermanence of that sort of, oh now I've got this shiny image and everything's fine. With with all that there is somehow in the middle of it in the in the midst of the difficulty with the difficulty around the difficulty there is this sense of somehow providence is operating here somehow this is perfect. And I, I, met, I think I wrote in my blog something about having a sense that um, my illness and even my early death is, is perfect. This is a few years ago. And someone said they really, they really didn't like that. And I can't remember their reasons, but it might, it might have been from a certain religious upbringing they had or, or something. But the way they were hearing it was as if it was a dogma. 
or a philosophy. Everything is perfect. Oh, everything is perfect. It's, it just is. It's a whole different, kind of much more superficial level. You can hear the brit- brittleness in it. Just try and view everything as perfect. It's it's silly. But here's here's, uh, and and you can tell when it's brittle. It has a brittle feeling to it, or it has a kind of. Uh, sometimes it's not brittle. It's just a little bit kind of almost deluded. Like this person is just not in touch with. Uh, the dukkha, or the grief, or the tragedy, or the loss, or whatever, or the pain. I'm not talking about a philosophy here, I'm not talking about a religious dogma or anything, I'm talking about, or, or a view, in, in the poor sense of the word view. I'm really talking about soul-making practice, sensing with soul. In this case, what I share was sensing my own illness, and the prognosis I was given, and the difficulty, and the physical dukkha, and the full knowledge of like likelihood of dying early, soon, in the next couple of years. Um, sensing that with soul and out of the very practice, not out of a, a kind of uh, a sort of cheap idea of religious teaching or philosophy, but out of the practice then, oh, I don't know what language you use, a mystical sense that everything is perfect. And not in a way that got rid of dukkha or put me out of touch with dukkha. In this sense also that everything is perfect, that comes out of practice. Again, it, 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 uh, like seeing the emptiness of things, if, it, if its fruit is then inaction, oh, everything's perfect so I don't have to worry about social injustice and racial injustice and environmental uh, injustice and all the rest of it. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. It's coming more from some idea uh, in, a, in, an, in, an, in an undigested way. It's not been digested in practice. It's just an idea. Some things, you can, you can feel it. It's just off. But this kind of sense of the perfection of things, this kind of sense of some mysterious providence working through tragedy, putting it in a bigger uh, arc, a bigger trajectory, a bigger picture, a bigger unfolding. And the sense that comes out of practice does not, is not brittle, includes the dukkha very much and the softness and the sensitivity of heart and the openness of heart and does not lead to inaction and not caring. So I'm really talking about what comes out of um, when we talk about a sense of things and a view of things that comes out of practice, not a, not a sort of easy idea. And, you know, like I said, most of the stuff I've been talking about, uh, certainly in this series of talks and other series, it it's, it's, uh, needs to be approached via practice rather than just hearing and not practicing, listening and not practicing, and just hearing some ideas or whatever, or hearing some far far out sounding experiences. It's only going to cause problems, or have no effect whatsoever. But if there's really that soil of practice being turned, then you have a very different understanding of what we're talking about here. Of course, I mean, in the examples I gave, you know, Jesus and John Coltrane and stuff, it's, it's, to me, clearly, you know, special people who really get a sense, wow, that something's going on there, they're really living that image, or whatever language one would use, the divine is really coming through. But, it, but this um, opening up and, uh, um, I don't know what the word is, redeeming, Redeemed, uh, redeeming of the sense of the death of a loved one. It's not only for special people. It happens, it can happen. It should happen, actually. It can happen in, in any relationship we have, in any deep relationship we have. Because in deep relationship, um, the other becomes image for us. In 
deep human relationship, the other becomes image for us. Deep relationship has imaginal dimensions. We've talked about this before in a way. So let me try and explain something and see, hopefully I can explain it. Um, When, in a way, this relates to stuff I talked about in the Four Parables of Stone and Light series when we're talking about soul-making diet practice. Um, but in a way, like I said, it, it actually applies. Uh, so this is part of the phenomenology, in, in other words, part of the actual experience, I would say, of any deep human relationship. Any time we really love or we're really uh, devoted to, to a relationship. We have, if we can explain it a certain way, maybe you can see it visually in your mind, um, if that helps. So we have the kind of, what's agreed on in, in society, uh, contemporary society, we have, we have one level of the relationship. There's this human being and that human being. And the relationship happens in time. And if I know this person long enough, then there's my... Um, old act, or rather the acts that are between us, um, the things we've done and the interactions we've had in the past. Um, so temporal, but in the past. And I still have access to at least some of them, if not many of them, um, through memory. And, of course, in an ongoing relationship, there's new actions and interactions and, and uh, di- dialogue and all that. So you have one level, and it's the agreed-upon level of what human relationship is. is It happens in time between two human beings who are actually conceived of as flat, not dimensional, other than being dimensional in the non-soul-making ways we consider human beings dimensional these days, uh, conventionally in the culture. So if you can see that as a kind of, uh, if you can make a diagram in your mind, human and human, and two lines between them, uh, old in old actions, let's say, and new actions. Um, and all of that is, is on a temporal level, is unfolding in time. But if on your little mental diagram, then above each of those humans, human A and human B, um, in this whatever relationship they have, maybe they're just really good friends, whatever it is, uh, in a way, there's the image. Let's just keep it singular for now. There's an image of uh, human A and an image of human B. And human A has a sense of their own image, their own daemon. So it's another, again, it's another dimension of their being. But human B also has uh, a sense of their daemon. And then each human has a sense of the other's daemon, so to speak. So there's, as in, in solving diapracts, you can you can play with this a little bit. But really, what I'm pointing to is what's there anyway in human relationship. So you've got now a diagram with human A and human B, and then whatever we're going to call image A and image B above corresponding to human A and human B. And that level of the image, so someone's living their image, uh, that level is a timeless level. And then the level in time is uh, new and old actions, interactions. But actually you've got relationships, or let's call it strands and directions of relationships between every, every corner here. So you've got two kinds of strand of relationship from the conventionally human to conventionally human level. The new and old interactions make two. You've got human A's interaction with their own image. And you've got human A's interaction with uh, human B's image. And human B's interaction with human A's image. And then you've got the image's interaction with each other. Now all of this kind of becomes much more... Uh, let's say, discriminated and discreet and uh, apparent when you really explore soul-making diet practices, as I 
unpacked a little bit in that long talk on soul making diet practice in the last series, uh, in the four parable series. But this is a way of thinking of what, what's actually going on. Uh, so it becomes more apparent in formal soul making diet practice, but I would say actually it's there in any deep human relationship where there's love and devotion to each other. That all these levels and all these uh, possible connections between different levels are going on. Now, in some people that think this way, and they're quite rare these days, but in some people, they use the terms image and analogue. So there's the image level, or we could say the daemon level, the angel level of a human being. And then what we've called up to now the human level is called the analogue. Like uh, so in a way the terms don't really matter. We could say image and analogue. The image is the timeless and the interactions between the analogue level happen in time. And image to analogue level happens sort of between the timeless and time. So I hope that makes sense a little bit. Let me say a bit more about that. Um, And why is this important? Because, as I said, I think this is what goes on in human relationships anyway. So usually in our culture, in our culture's language, um, image is, the word image is considered a secondary phenomenon. We say an image of this or that, uh, and this or that is primary. So it's an, an image of a tree. It's not the real tree. The real tree is the real thing, and the image of the tree is is a secondary thing. It re- represents something more fundamental or something real. But as we were talking about just yesterday, I think it was in fact, um, Plato had that whole ontology reversed, the hierarchy reversed, so that the ideal realm was considered by Plato more real. And this world was a representation, an attempt uh, uh, at, at reflecting, refracting that more uh, ideal world. So the image, uh, in that way of thinking about it, is primary, and the analogue, or we call the human, is secondary. So wor- words are tricky here, but also ontologies are really important here. Now for one, for what I want to say, actually, we could have either ontology. We could have the image level, what we're calling the image level as primary, or and the analog or human level as secondary, or we could reverse that and consider the human primary and the image secondary. In a way, it doesn't make much difference, but I do think in the overall kind of scope of soul-making dharma practice, there will come a time inevitably where... Uh, at times, that hierarchy gets the sense of that hierarchy gets reversed, and you can play with that, or you can even deliberately play with entertaining such an idea, such a notion, or it will just get reversed anyway in the natural unfolding of soul making practice um, for a time. And again, it's then not clung to as this is the truth, this is the way things are, this is the correct conceptual framework. It becomes part of uh, a, f- a flexibility, a, fle- a range of flexible conceptual frameworks that we can work with. Uh, one of my favourite composers, I think he's a great composer, he died just a few years ago, Paul, uh, Peter Maxwell Davis, has, uh, I think, a really stunning, stunningly beautiful, very complex but stunningly beautiful piece called Image, Reflection, Shadow. Uh, I think it's for a quintet or sextet. And image, reflection, shadow, and uh, reading his liner notes, what he meant by that was, or it came to him seeing, and somehow is sort of played out in the music, but um, his his notion here, but he saw a seagull over uh, sunlit water by the sea, where he lived, he used to live um, one of the islands of, uh, of, of Scotland, and composed a lot of music there, which really has a lot of the atmosphere of the the, the sea and the, the space and the old magic up there. Anyway, image, reflection, shadow was this seagull um, uh, oh, f- flying low over over the sea, and the sun was out, so it was 
both reflected in the water. The image of the bird was, was there was a reflection in the water. There was the image of the bird uh, for his eyes, and there was the reflection in the water, and there was the shadow of the seagull on the water. And so somehow he that became a sort of paradigm for the for the music somehow or other. Um, but maybe these words are are better: image, reflection, shadow. So reflection or refraction may be a better word than analog for some of us. Image, we are the reflection or refraction potentially of an image, daemon. And shadow meaning uh, with that connotation of dark, of relative darkness, that even uh, our dis- uh, distortions are somehow poor and blocked uh, vestiges or echoes of an original emanation. So like a light shadow is that. It's a it's a, a vestige. It's what's remaining of light that's blocked by something, partially blocked by something, but it's also an echo of light, if we can speak of because it's light reflected off from other places uh, where that thing is not in the way. But even our, we've talked about this before, even our mistakes and our neuroses and our malfunctions can potentially be seen as related to uh, that original emanation from the image. So we get the reflection, the refraction, when it's the sort of, uh, when we're more true to that image. But even our messed up uh, stuff is uh, can be seen, our distortions, as, as, as the poor and blocked um, echoes or vestiges of that. Um, actually, in fact, um, image and whatever we're going to call it, refraction or analog, are mutually dependent. They affect each other. It's not so much that uh, it's not entirely or strictly speaking a one-way emanation process from image to reflection, refraction from image to analog, from image to human. We understand as part of the soul-making dharma understanding is that they they ref, they affect each other there's a mutual dependency there and another thing about this idea and um, before I say what's this got to do with death etc is uh, in a way I've touched on it hinted at it I alluded to it but um, we could and I did when I say well, can you imagine a diagram where image is above he draw the image above the human just to get a sense of all the different lines between the different uh, between the different uh, corners uh, or you know human a human b image a image b whatever um, of course we could i suppose conceive uh, the relationship between image and analog here uh, in spatial relationship or spatial constellation as like above below uh, or below, above, or around, within, or within, around. You know, the image is within the human, or uh, below, it comes up from the, the depths, the dark, rich depths of the earth, or it comes down from the luminous heights of heaven, or whatever. We could conceive them in spatial terms like that, in any of those spatial terms. But much better, I think, uh, is probably to jettison the idea of a spatial and a temporal location or existence of image or angel or daemon. Okay, I've touched on this before, sometime in the last year or so. This is really, really important. Um... Perhaps the analog is the manifestation in space and time, a partial and refracted manifestation in space and time of what is non-spatial, non-temporal, what is timeless, the image. So this image has a kind of timeless existence. The angel is neither spatial nor temporal. And the analog is this refraction or reflection 
into time and into space of what is not spatial and not t- and not temporal. And again, uh, we can say all this, okay, that's really metaphysical, far out metaphysical ideas, but is it not the kind of sense we have of things if we just open up soul-making practice? That at some point, this is the kind of sense we have of things. And this is there in a germinal way, at least, or a non-articulated, non-discriminated way in relationships where there is love and there are deep relationships and there are intimate relationships and we have that. Um, that's all mixed up and it's just our culture doesn't have the language or the conceptual framework that supports that kind of articulation or discrimination. So, what I want to ask now is, what happens to this whole constellation of relationship, which means the sense, the sense of relationship after one person dies? Because actually, um, in a way, most of the fabricating constituents of, of the sense of, let's say, the person who dies... Um, for the person who remains alive. Most of the fabricating and the creating, discovering constituents uh, re- remain. The image of the other, the memory of past uh, interactions, actions, and even potentially new interactions, but mediated by a purely, if we could say, a purely imaginal consciousness. So of all the kind of strands of connection in our little diagram, it's only the analog to analog, human to human level of new actions, new interactions that doesn't remain, that seems to have gone after death. Most of the fabricating, the creating, discovering constituents of the sense of the one who has died and what makes our sense of them is actually still there, remains after after their death. Actually, I don't know, are any of the constituents uh, really fully separate from any other? I don't think they are. But as I said, if in fact a human person, a hu- you know, what we mean by human, <clears throat> what we sense of a human person, what we can sense of a human person, is really or more fully comprised of what in this sort of scheme I've tried to probably very clumsily explain, um, is comprised of what uh, we call, uh, what, or in, that, in this kind of scheme is called image and human, or image and analog. In other words, that's really what a human being is, and that's really the sense of what we have as a human being, what we have of human beings, human beings that we love. If it's really that, then the question is, does does death change that much? Or is it potentially that death changes only a small portion of the actuality of human relationships? Because the image to image and human to image and image to human and the memory of human to human level old actions in time all that remains so this is quite I hope I've explained it clearly enough I I probably could have done better but Again, it's so different than how we usually, uh, how we've grown up, what we've inherited in terms of the way we think about human being, and the way we think about what am I in relationship with, and what is a person. Because there's no room in our culture for this imaginal level, or this idea of somehow this person is refracting something timeless, 
and the relationship is multi-stranded and multi-dimensional between two human beings, and a human being is multi-dimensional. It's very uh, unsupported as a notion in our culture, so it might sound completely uh, bizarre, even ridiculous, what I'm trying to say, if, if you can follow it even. And I certainly don't mean, again, to say, oh, just see things this way and then there'll be no grief. But it's certainly, I hope it's clear, not the same as saying, oh, well, they'll die and you've got your memories already. You've got your memories, at least. I'm saying much more than that. That's right. Right now, in relationships with the living, if we open our sense of that, if we can sense with soul, with the love, and you see, sense then, what's, what's actually there, what's already there in your sense of human being, when they're sensed with soul? And then what does that do to the sense of death? or the sense of loss. It doesn't, it won't take the grief away, but it will give something that, in a way, we prevent ourselves from receiving and being open to and having. Or we are prevented by, by the culture, by the uh, linguistic and conceptual inheritances. Someone we love dies, and there's still all these different dimensions of relationship there that were there when they were alive too. It's not like now they die, and now they're moving in space and time somewhere in the spirit world, and maybe we can communicate with them through a seance or something. While we're alive, these other dimensions are there. And if we acknowledge these other dimensions and these other connections between dimensions and uh, the different, as I said, the different uh, strands of communication, of love, of connection, of seeing, of intercourse, while we're alive, and we start to have a different sense of how much we've lost when, when a person dies. Images with us. Image communicates with us. We communicate with image. Image communicates with image. Memory becomes image. Think about you know this sense of human being again, the sense of human person and personhood, and what is it to really be a person? What is it not to limit the sense of what what a human being is and what a human person is and our personhood? You know a lot about the Dharma is about deconstructing the sense of self and all that, seeing its fabricated nature, stripping it down. And that, that, you know that's so valuable. And we can talk about um, you know completely unfabricating the sense of self, or less fabricated sense of self, or really the most the most uh, basic sense of self, which is the, the the bare sense of a subject of an awareness, with the bare sense of an object, and the barest, the most basic, the most basic is a better way to put barest, the most basic sense of time of a present moment, and that's the sort of the the most basic level of self-fabrication, this side of the unfabricated. And then you fabricate, fabricate, fabricate. And one way we can fabricate it is towards Papancha. Crazy ideas about ourselves and others and relationships and all rarefied and tight, you know, uh, 
tied up in, in, in knots with it. But there's also fabrication that's skillful. We've talked about soul-making fabrication, the fabrication of uh, soul, soul, soulful image in the imaginal. So I don't know about language, but we could say, you know, you're actually, one is a self whenever there is a any perception of objects, whenever there's any subject-object, even the barest, like just a nothingness and an awareness. Subject, object, object, subject. But we are, I don't know what the word would be, we are persons, full persons, only where there is relationship of some complexity with some sense for us of meaningfulness and depth and dimensionality of our persons and another's. And that relationship, it may be relationship with a physically manifesting sentient being, someone who's alive with us, or or an animal. It may be relationship with a divinity, an angel, a so-called purely imaginal, imaginally manifesting. Or it may be something in nature, uh, uh, what's supposedly non-sentient. But, I don't know if that's the right division of language, self and person, but subject and person, maybe. We are persons when we are in relationship, when there is relationship as a set of some complexity for us, with some sense for us of meaningfulness, of depth, of dimensionality, of our own personhood and of uh, the others. So even when there's just the beginnings of that, of meaningfulness, of depth, of dimension, even just the beginnings of what we would say the elements of the imaginal, perhaps, then we're more than subjects, we're persons. You can use self for the whole spectrum if you want, the word self for the whole spectrum. But both subjects and persons are empty. They're dependent arisings. But as always, and as I keep stressing, the fact of emptiness, the fact of their emptiness, the fact of the emptiness of any conception and any sense and any view of subject, self, person, means um, that actually that we are free to view that way. Because all views are empty. We're free to view that way. We're free to pick up that view if we want. And the question is, what does it lead to? What does it open for us? And what does it limit? As I said, if I'm always, if if I love someone, and I think, oh, they, 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 they died or they're dying, and so I'll use my Buddhist history and practice, and I'll regard them as um, a process of the aggregates. It just does not do justice to our relationship, to their personhood, to their life. It doesn't do, certainly doesn't do justice to soul. It's phenomenologically incomplete. What will it lead to, if that's my only view? I'm always trying to or thinking I should see the other person as a process of aggregates. Just going back to teachings we've given for a while, there's the whole teaching about fabrication, there's unfabricating, and there's uh, skillful fabricating and unskillful fabricating. The question is, what does it lead to? All of it's empty, all of it's empty. So we can pick up uh, anywhere on these spectrum, spectra and uh, adopt a view. And the question is, what does it open for us? What does it deliver? What does it give us? And so I hope you followed, followed this. Uh, again, I probably could have explained it better, but... Um, it would be, I think, very common to think, well, okay, well, that's all a metaphysical theory about what a human being is and about, you know, uh, an image and an analogue and a level of angels and all this stuff. 
is it though, or again, or is it more a phenomenological account? In other words, it's how we experience persons in relation to our person anyway when there's love, when there's a real depth of connection, when there's a soulfulness in the connection, when we have a sense of uh, you know, a relationship that we're devoted to. We've been, you know, gradually over the course of history, in do- recent history, indoctrinated to believe and then to experience in line with um, a view of what a human being is and what the cosmos is. That you know, some of which we traced in the recent talks on ethics, the image of ethics, was actually started as, um, you know, from metaphysical theories, from philosophies from theological moves about not having intermediaries and about the elevation of ordinary life and not having hierarchical order of the cosmos, which then got replaced with a horizontal order. All all those um, philosophical, metaphysical and theological moves had repercussions, as we very sketchily traced through history, so that what we feel now as normal and non-metaphysical, we feel like we're just seeing things as they are naturally without any uh, overlay or distortion or, or through metaphysics and all that, and philosophy and strange religious notions. But actually it had its roots in, um, as I said, in philosophy, metaphysics, the- theology and religious notions. Also had its roots in um, the the gradual birth of the modern novel, uh, this view of humanity, with emphasis on um, particularities, on ordinary life, and the modern novel. One of its one of its main uh, origins seeds was um, journals written by Puritans who had this view of a very personal, unmediated relation with God in a non-hierarchical universe, etc. Sorry, unmediated relationship with God. So all this, you know, what we tend to think, oh, you've just described some really complex, bizarre metaphysics as some kind of weird idea that you're trying to superimpose on the way things really are. But maybe our sense of the way things really are is actually uh, a uh, an indoctrination, an inculcation, an inheritance from something that started um, from metaphysics, theology, philosophy, and b our sense of the way things are is not actually an accurate report for us of the way things are for us. Look closer, sense closer when there's love, and the relationship is really alive that way. Again, are, are, is it not the case that the, at least the germs of what we're trying to talk about here are actually already there in the sense we have of things? And there's something um, that we've inherited that just makes us rule that out, or not take that seriously, or not see it even, not sense it, not discriminate, discern, and uh, articulate it, and then in that way give it support. So, we lose someone to death, they die, we're left. And yet, it may be that a lot more is possible in terms of the continuing sense of relationship, connection with them than we tend to think that a lot less of the real whole of what was there in our relationship, what flowed in our relationship, a lot less is lost of the whole than we thought. That much more is still open, still possible, still alive, really. And yes, there's still grief. There's still loss, there's still the pain of that, there's still the wishing it weren't the case, perhaps. But to 
open this up, it was almost like, you know, we have to allow ourselves to see and uh, and the, the sensing the soul will really help to open up this sense. Um, so that's one part. That's a few possibilities. I want to share something from a close friend um, in relationship just tracing she was okay for me to share this I asked her um, uh, slightly different uh, well quite different um, journey and approach to loss of a loved one in this case my my uh, my being given a metastatic diagnosis pancreatic cancer which is pretty much always fatal and um, it was shortly after I got that diagnosis, and with all the implications that we knew uh, that life was, you know, I was going to die from this uh, probably quite soon. Um, so this is part parts of her report. I will I will read. Um, so th- again, what I'm really showing here is how can uh, this t- terrible deep grief and loss at the death of someone we love, how can that be opened up in a different way? How can it, um, how can the soul making uh, and the sensing of soul soul, uh, help and support that to be opened up in a different way? A different sense of that, different possibilities. So I'd been, I'd got that diagnosis, knew what it meant and the implications of dying. That I would not be uh, cured from this disease, that it would kill me uh, relatively soon. And so she was uh, quite upset and quite distraught. And this is only part of her account, um, so this is in her words now. Can this become soul-making, he gently asked. He is me. Can this become soul-making? Can this become soul-making, he gently asked reminding me through his question that this was possible and what I wanted. Thank you. Yes, it can, I said. Recognizing in that moment I was a little stuck and in some vague contention with the reality of the situation. And while contention felt better than collapsing, it definitely wasn't soul-making. And so perhaps this can be my question now as we embark on this leg of the journey. And then she kind of just lists the her awareness of what this leg of the journey would involve and imply and the dukkha and the loss and uh, all of that. And so, can this become soul-making? In theory, yes it can. And what will support that? Remembering this question for a start and recognizing that caring for the dukkha in this way could be a fitting and beautiful offering to my beloved friend. In other words, caring for the dukkha through soul-making. My faith tells me this is possible. I have faith in soul-making. She's done a lot of soul-making practice. My faith tells me this is possible. But I do not know what this will look like as we face this time, or if I am up to the task. But I can see that, that the question itself offers a frame, a way to orient to the time ahead, whatever it may bring. So I really want you to hear the wisdom in this. It's all, it's all about the skill in the approach, and the wisdom in the approach. There's this difficulty, stuckness, then contention, collapse, then just contention, then this, oh, what, can it be soulmate? Yes, it can. I have some faith in that. So that's already a big step. And then what will support that? And, and the question, can it be soulmaking? What will support the soulmaking here itself? That question, as she says, offers a frame, a way to orient the time ahead, whatever it may bring, whatever the time ahead may bring. She continues, and as I let the question strike me, I light up. My sense and my posture straighten naturally, and I line up as if I'm filled with trillions of iron fillings that line up before a magnet. Okay, I recognize this is helpful. She's using the energy body sense uh, as telling her she's on the right track. Taking on this question, can this become soul-making? I am already much less in contention with the reality of the situation 
and my loving desire is switched on again towards what I most love, soul making. This lining up, as well as being strengthening and helpful, seems to make my human heart at once incredibly vulnerable, impactable and tender, and at the same time steady, bright and unwavering as if allowing this question to strike me has the effect of beginning to shape me into the kind of organism that might be able to perceive all of this soulfully. See the art and the skill here? Just, can this become soul-making? What will support that? And then that question, together with a little bit of faith, starts to do something. Starts to uh, shape her into, into the kind of organism, she writes, that might be able to perceive all of this soulfully. I sense myself at a threshold now where the conventional sense of myself who is looking forward in time to the painful and demanding journey ahead gets the sense of more possibilities with this inevitable dukkha. Something in the air is attractive to me and my soulful antennae, my soul antennae are peaked. More is possible here. She realizes more is possible here. And, staying close to the emotional impact of this news, I feel first what I might still call a contention with reality. I don't want you to die. I don't want my beloved friend to die. Because I don't. But I let myself sense this without collapsing around it. She lets herself sense the contention, I don't want you to die, without collapsing around it. And then comes the desire. Okay, that's the other the other side of that, I don't want you to die, is I feel a strong desire, a desire for him to be well, and a desire for him to live forever. I want you to live forever. Not cutting that off for being ridiculous and unrealistic, just letting myself have it. So human, so understandable, so, so passionate. And very close to this desire, I feel a kind of objective helplessness of being human beings in the face of death. Okay, so there's so much here. There's the contention, the don't want, then realizing there's a want that's the flip side of the want. Not dismissing the want, even if it sounds ridiculous. I want you to live forever. How could that possibly be? Unrealistic. Letting herself have it. Letting herself have uh, that very human, understandable passion. And then close to that desire, very naturally, and there should be the sense of Helplessness. We're helpless as human beings in the face of death. And she continues, As I sense the current of the desire in my body, this desire, I want you to live forever, it comes through this vulnerable and utterly human spot in my heart. And that narrow spot in my heart starts to expand with the current. And as it expands, it is also illuminated. And as everything gets brighter in the whole chitta, I am stopped in my tracks. My senses are arrested by a beauty that I start to sense. Something is happening here, and a beauty is opening up, and it's arresting. Right there, not divorced from the pain and reality of the situation, not losing any of its personalness, right there, he and I are being woven into image. A soulscape of extraordinary beauty, Horizontal time is relieved from being the whole and the only truth. And I am somehow being loved by this whole scene, by the whole image. He and I woven into image and horizontal time, not the whole truth. The whole scene is loving her, that's her sense. And the grace of this until now only unwanted suffering, the grace is apparent and makes me humble. His illness and imminent death not reducible to a single meaning for him, for me, or for the Sangha. This perception is so blessed, so blessed. The pain is not necessarily taken away, but it is happening within a soulful cosmos where dimensionality and meaningfulness are shimmering with a startling beauty right here in the tragedy and loss at once deeply human and utterly beyond. Can this become soul-making? Yes, it can. And I bow. 
this was the first stage, actually, of uh, a journey with this whole um, ensouled relationship with death. Started to really open something up. A little while later, she had a dream. And the dream, in the dream, there was a black snake coming out of the coming out from down under a kitchen counter in the house where she grew up and she was sitting in the dream with her family and everyone was sort of horrified oh my god it's a black snake that shouldn't be there and at some point in the dream it shifted to somehow that's not it's not wrong somehow it's not wrong that this snake is there at first it felt it was wrong and then somehow it didn't so in the way that uh, sometimes what is immediately disturbing or to the mind, the usual mind, or the mind thinks, oh, that's wrong, that can't be right, in imaginal practice. Um, in a similar way, that, that shift happened in the dream. And the next morning, she took that image of the black snake uh, into her meditation practice and let it become imaginal, helped it become imaginal, and found that the snake loved her, as it would if it becomes imaginal. It's one of the elements, one of the elements of the imaginal. But also that the snake itself seemed to kind of contain multiple images, and uh, one of these images related to, uh, or, or kind of related to then, um, uh, my, my death and her feelings about my death. So again, at some point later on, there was again this, I don't want you to die. And again, she really let herself fear, feel it. And letting herself have this, I don't want, um, uh, loosened something, really letting herself have this, I don't want you to die. Uh, it loosens something without diminish, dissolve, without dissolving that I don't want. Right? So we can loosen things so that they dissolve and completely unfabricate, or we can loosen things so that enough, uh, with a slight unfabricating, so that they actually um, can become more soul-making. So it's like a cry out to the cosmos, I don't want you to die don't want you to die. And she also realized that um, uh, if she was either a good Buddhist or a good existentialist, um, she wouldn't have this thought, I don't want you to die. And again, that I want you to live forever, and how ridiculous that sounds from a sort of Buddhist perspective or an existential existentialist perspective. And with all this, she noticed something else, that her sense of death, her sort of almost subliminal uh, sense of death, was a kind of, uh, of a big, black, empty space. And she realized, very subtle discrimination, she realized, oh, this is the usual sense of death in the cultures that I move in. Either it's a kind of nihilistic nothingness, just a big, black, empty space, the end of personhood, or it's a kind of spiritual big black empty space, a kind of excuse me, universal emptiness of oneness or essence excuse me and she's like, hmm my logos here my uh, what I'm used to thinking, my habitual conception and notion is part of uh my my sense of death here uh, that's being brought in automatically and it's and it's coloring it's shaping it's forming and limiting the view i have of death either to the standard secular view a kind of nihilistic view or a kind of spiritual assumption of this uh, dissolving into universal emptiness whatever I'm realizing ah oh, conditioned by the Logos, as we talked about right at the beginning tonight. And that realization, ah, that there's some conditioning by the Logos, by the imported habitual notions here that I get from the two main cultures I move in, mainstream secular culture and uh, the culture of Buddha Dharma, or spiritual circles. Realizing that fact of the conditioning by, by a Logos, by an idea, an imported, habitual, unquestioned ideas. That, in realizing it, that lost its grip, and the sense of my death was uh, allowed, and death itself was was allowed to become more imaginal. She 
she also realized something else that um, if uh, if she could uh, there, there was a notion that um, if she could accept the pain then she would be at peace with it or she should be at peace with it so there's a lot realizing about what the what the imprisoning logos was what the limiting logoi were and where she had got them in fact because the acceptance and peace with it also comes from Buddhist and spiritual teachings. And it was that realization that loosened something, and then, and then the sense of death could become imaginal. And then, she said, there was a sense, then, then I got the sense that your death is eternal. It's always here. My friend's death is eternal, it's always here. So it was more than not, it certainly wasn't not wanting death, but it's more than accepting death. And as it was allowed to become image and become eternal and always here, your death is always here, then, then she got the sense, in the very palpable and moving sense, your death loves me. Your death loves me. Of course, from a, from a, mainstream, conventional, typical perspective, like, what on earth does that mean? Your death loves me? But when things and events uh, become imaginal, when we sense them with soul, even things and events, not even talking about um, insentient, organic beings like trees, but things and events, your death, when it becomes imaginal, when they become imaginal, they have personhood. They have intelligence and autonomy and love and eros. And this made so much skill here and beauty in the way of working, very difficult. But then so much uh, being touched, the soul being touched by the sense of your death loves me. Your death loves me. And your death is eternal. It's always here. It's always already happening. The death has become image with all the beauty and all the gifts that are given to us in, 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 when we sense something with soul. All the gifts that that opens up in our sense of something. So in a way that was a second stage. Uh, and then so Something happened, perhaps more long term, uh, the, um, in her in her logos, in the ideation that she carried around. That death um, is not only an impersonal thing, and more importantly, that impersonal depth is not more true than personhood. So, as if that big black empty space, from a spiritual perspective or from a uh, nihilistic perspective is somehow more true. Uh, well, actually, she's talking mostly in a spiritual context. Sometimes we're taught to see that emptiness is more true, that absolute is more true than personhood, etc. Now with these experiences, uh, 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 impersonal depth is not necessarily more true than personhood. So it opened up something more permanently in her ideation and perspective, in her logos around de- death. So this uh, uh, this uh, becoming image of my death, becoming imaginal, and my death loving her, a um, little later on enabled uh, for her her death to become image for herself, to become imaginal image. So here, as the third stage, she's describing a practice she did actually while she was taking a flight. And so she was practicing on, on a plane, and uh, her death became image. She writes, My death as beloved other, as deity, as enchanted, the most fulfilling perception. I love the image of my death. She is here as beloved other, the most intimate other. She knows me so well. I feel loved in a way I have never before known. So my death is here as beloved other, the most intimate other, who knows me so well, 
and I feel loved by this, by death, in a way that I have never known. I love her, and I ask, how can I come closer to you? I want to know you more. So there's the eros, an eros in a way that is going to allow the whole eros psyche logos dynamic to ignite further, open, expand, complexify, deepen. And she writes, I contract for a moment in judgment as fellow passengers on this flight throw away their plastic cups after one drink. I contract and lose sight of my death, of the sense of the image of her death. The destruction of the planet and our ignorance seemingly more real than my beloved. But my heart, but I see my heart is lost for that moment. And so I light a candle at the altar of my beloved and I kneel. So again, something, just to highlight the skill in working, is something d- distracts, something contracts her. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, she's on a flight that she had thought a lot about even taking, uh, given the climate crisis, had decided to take it, decided on the balance of things it was uh, the right thing to do. And uh, her soul called, you know, f- f- felt the this, this, this soul-making choice to do and then contracting at this throwing away of plastic so easily. That distracts her uh, and interrupts her process. There's a contraction of the being, and she loses the image. And she says, okay, okay, I recognize what's going on. Can I, so to speak, um, light a candle at the altar of my beloved and kneel? So there's the taking care of, I think what I called the other day, the the poise for soul-making that enables us to open to soul-making, to image. And then she says, Tears upon my return, and the settling of the disorientation that came in the contracting. I love you. She's talking about her death. I love my death. I love you. You feel like the most meaningful relationship I have ever had, in so many ways. It is as if you were there before I was born. So again, to, to, from the... N- mainstream point of view, this is all probably sounds completely mad. Someone talking about the, the image of the death, I love you. It is as if you were there before I was born. You define my existence, not in the existentialist or literal ways of being an end point. Your reality status is not end point. That designation flattens you, and in so doing one would not see your beauty. You are more a beginning point, if anything. But careful, there's no implication here of the usual beliefs of afterlife or rebirth or whatever. As a, uh, a, she's not talking about beginning point in those senses, the beginning of the afterlife, the beginning of the next birth or whatever. You are the most beautiful image I have ever seen, and the death of my body in time seems like one tiny image within your numberless dimensions. I can hardly believe it. It is not that physical death is insignificant, It is indeed one image in the wings of your magnificence, but you are so much more. You, my death, are resounding right through the cosmos. You are so intimately personal to me, and yet you seem to ring everywhere in many spheres, all at the same time. You know me as a point of time and space, and you love me as a human more closely and precisely than anything. And yet you also intimately mirror a multitude of other images, Images that seem to exist in multiple other realms. So the whole image is, again, doing exactly what we'd expect if Eros is allowed to uh, galvanize and open the soul-making dynamic, the Eros Psyche Logos, and mutually fertilize each other, complexify, etc., take each other deeper, wider, further. She continues, This is different from the personal and seemingly eternal death in Carlos Castaneda, I don't really know that, but she's referring to it, where one can consult this intimate companion about how to love one's life, knowing that death is always here at your shoulder. My death is not principally a point in time, or related to the point of space and time of my physical death, and nor is my death an annihilation, and nor is she impersonal. My death is somehow my fulfillment, and meeting her now, I am called to my fulfillment, But this fulfillment is now, and eternally now, when she is known in erotic, imaginal meeting. I am drawn to this fulfillment, but it is not a fulfillment of accumulation of qualities. It's not that kind of fulfillment. 
It is a fulfillment of knowing my place as soul in a sacred cosmos, so completely woven into all dimensions, and that guiding divine being is my death. Here death as idea is soft and elastic, and death in time is one image in the divine theatre. It is not about making my physical death unimportant or relativized or small. To say small would contrast it with big or bigger, and this is not the correct word for what is more for is not the correct word for what is more or more than one image. Sorry, is not the correct word for what is more or more than one image. Logically, one should be able to say that the collective of multiple images is bigger than or greater than one image, like ten is more than one. However, in in eternality and in the imaginal middle way, smaller than and bigger than do not make sense. In eternality and in the imaginal middle way, smaller than and bigger than do not make sense. It is not governed by logic. Size and proportions only belong with the arising of time and space and the appearance of this world. This lack of proportions is somehow very significant. And this is very different from the results of Buddhist reflections on death, as as I have practiced them at least. This reflection does not rouse my passion as an urgency for a path of practice in time. That's how we usually, or one of the ways we usually teach reflection on death, to arouse urgency for practice, path of practice in time. But she says, it's not, it's not that. But it does rouse my passion as a tremendous eros for eternality, for timelessness. It does rouse my passion as a tremendous eros for eternality. It does also bring a steadying of my heart, but I wouldn't say it is an equanimity born from understanding and including the whole picture and being able to see the conditions of the world of time and space from a great view. It's not that kind of standard way, uh, one of the standard ways we reach equanimity, seeing the whole picture, stepping back, seeing, taking, a, taking a larger view of conditions in a large span of t- time and space. Rather, the steadying comes from the mind easily concentrating because this is the most compelling, meaningful and loving encounter. There is no effort to steady the heart. We could unpack this a a lot more, I think, and and, uh, explore the steadiness and equanimity from lots of other aspects too. Uh, She touched on some of that in other talks and things about eros and equanimity and stuff. But there's a lot to say here. But she says, and my death smiles at me as I recognize this. My duty is to re-enchant death. So, so much here, um, in terms of the skillful ways of working, in terms of the ways um, something can start as a difficulty, just asking the question, can this be soul-making? can allow it to open up, get a different sense of it, then that can be added to by an image that at first has seems to have nothing to do with it, a black snake, a snake, and open further. And then we get a very different sense of things. Very different sense, in this case, of my death, of her friend's death. And then uh, that kind of gave her a confidence and a platform, or, or yeah, I feel like was a a spark that in, in her turn, uh, or in its turn, allowed her to sense her own death with soul, for her own death to become image. And that opening up all the sense of beauty and dimensionality there, sacredness. In terms of her death, but also in terms of the whole cosmos. So much uh, that's instructive, I think, in all this. I just wanted to include that for that reason, um, as well as what I shared earlier. Just to say, to offer some possibilities uh, for opening up our sense of death and dying, whether it's our own or another's. What can we bring? to that, how can we meet that with soul genuinely, and what happens, what might happen when we do. So these are real possibilities.
possibilities for the soul, possibilities that make a real difference. So important. So there for us. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.